You wait all year for a vaccine and then three come along all at once. Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna and now the UK's very own Oxford AstraZeneca. And it was good, if slightly complicated news. The results from the Oxford AstraZeneca trial show overall it is 70% effective, but the team carried out trials using different amounts of the vaccine. For those who received two full doses four weeks apart, it was found to have 62% efficacy. But counterintuitively, for those who received an initial half dose, followed by a full dose a month later, it was found to be 90% effective. Roughly a third of the people got the half dose, full dose, and two thirds got the full dose, full dose. If we put them all together, the efficacy result comes out at 70.4%. We thought that the immune responses were similar from these two doses, and in terms of quantity, um, in the simple analyses we've done so far, they are. In terms of quality, in terms of the nuances of how that immune response protects people, there must be some differences, because it, it, there's quite a big difference between the two different regimens. One suggestion is that the smaller initial dose primes the immune system to give a bigger and better response when it meets the virus, but more work will need to be done on this. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is based on a weakened common cold virus, while the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines use a synthetic version of a coronavirus genetic material called mRNA. The Oxford trial involved over 23,000 participants. For Pfizer, this was 44,000 and Moderna, 30,000, with each giving their vaccine to about half their volunteers. The others received a dummy injection. Of the total number of participants in the Oxford trial, there were 131 people who eventually tested positive for COVID-19, only 30 of whom had actually had the real vaccine. So far, Oxford AstraZeneca have 90% efficacy on one and a half doses, while Pfizer BioNTech has reported 95% and Moderna 94.5%. The World Health Organization puts the benchmark for a successful vaccine at 70% efficacy for at least one year. If there is one vaccine that's saying 95% and one vaccine that's saying 72%, why wouldn't people demand the 95% one? We need to think about protecting populations and not protecting individuals. And the sooner we can get large percentages of a population immunised, particularly the vulnerable people, but also other members of the population, that's what really starts to have an effect on transmission. And we have to reduce transmission of this virus if we're going to return to normal life. So it certainly wouldn't be the best thing to do to wait and hold out for a vaccine that um, has a better number coming out of an interim analysis three results so far from different vaccines and all of them still need regulatory approval but that could happen very quickly. Oxford and AstraZeneca they're ready to go. They could give the UK four million doses before Christmas and they could provide another 40 million by Easter. The data available is already with the authority, the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency. We have a rolling submission ongoing in terms of submitting the data that would enable the regulators to, to be confident that we have a safe and effective vaccine. And once they've opined on that decision um, and the vaccine is approved um, in the UK, then we can start to supply and, and, and have vaccine distributed, for, you know, hopefully from end of December and then moving into uh, the first quarter of the year. And by the first quarter of the year, we, you know, we, we hope that we can have immunised a significant amount of the population with this vaccine. This was good news too for those who took part in the trial. I think the knowledge that you're part of history and that everyone involved in the trial was, was trying to find a solution was really interesting. And it was just slightly tender and that was it. The next day, gone. Um, but that was the only thing. So I like to think my body was saying, yes, you've got something to fight to. And uh, hence the fact I had a slight tenderness. All the vaccines have high rates of protection against the virus, but the Oxford results also show it may reduce asymptomatic infection, which could prevent transmission. And in terms of safety, there were no hospital admissions or severe cases. I would happily have it myself. I would have volunteered for the trial if people taking part in the trial had been eligible, but we weren't. And yes, I wouldn't have any qualms about uh, anybody in my family taking the vaccine. 
This jab also has some added extras. It can be stored in an ordinary fridge, is significantly cheaper than the other two candidates. And if the half-dose, full-dose regimen is approved, there will be even more of the vaccine to go around. And the Prime Minister is speaking right now. Let's listen to him in Downing Street. Do your best for the community. Get a test to help to squeeze the disease and reduce the restrictions that your town or city or area community has endured. And that way, through tough tiering and mass community testing, we hope to let people see a little more of their family and friends over Christmas. Now, I know that many of us want and need Christmas uh, with our families. We feel uh, after this year we deserve it. But this is not the moment to let the virus rip for the sake of Christmas parties. It is the season to be jolly, but it is also the season to be jolly careful, especially uh, with elderly relatives. And uh, working with the uh, devolved administrations, we will set out shortly how we want to get the balance right for Christmas, and uh, we'll be sending that out later this week. Christmas this year, will be different and we want to remain prudent through Christmas and beyond into the new year. But we will use the three tools that I've described to squeeze the virus in the weeks and months ahead. Tiering, testing and the rollout of vaccines. Employing all three techniques together so as to drive down R and drive down the infection rate. And uh, I really am assured now that things will look and feel very different uh, indeed after Easter. And, and that idea of, a, of, a, of an end goal or date is important because at last, uh, if the promise of the vaccines is fulfilled, we do have a, something to work for, a, a timescale, a goal around which we can all, uh, businesses can begin tentatively to plan. But with luck, and with hard work, we will be seeing improvements before then. For now, the problem is not a shortage of hope or a lack of optimism, not with the amazing news that we're getting from the, the laboratories in this country. The challenge now, as we face this difficult winter ahead, is to fight down any over-optimism, uh, to, to master any tendency to premature celebration of success. That success will come all the faster if we work together to follow the guidance, maintain the basic disciplines as people have done so heroically over the last few months. Hands, face, space, get a test if you have symptoms, because that is the way we will beat the virus together. I'm now going to hand over uh, to Chris Whitty to say a little bit about where we are uh, with the vaccine and then uh, to uh, go to Andrew Pollard. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. In fact, I was only going to say one thing, and that was an absolutely massive thank you to all of those uh, up and down this country every day who are volunteering for studies uh, into COVID, some in vaccines, some in drugs, uh, some in testing, and many in just trying to understand the disease. Because as we've repeatedly said, it is only science that is going to get us out of this hole. And UK uh, people across the UK are contributing enormously to this by volunteering uh, their time, volunteering uh, their expertise. Very large numbers of NHS workers, National Institute for Health uh, Research, NIHR workers, Medical Research Council workers, working with the academics and working, in, uh, working with the companies. So it is only by this combination of science that we will defeat it. And I just wanted to thank people uh, fr from all of us for this enormous uh, thing they've done uh, to help us and everybody uh, get out of the COVID hole. But it will be a long haul. And I really, the main news from today is the remarkably good uh, scientific achievement of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And Professor Pollard uh, is the person who really can best uh, outline that, Andy. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, it is, I think, a very exciting day for all of us. And I, we, we're hugely proud of, of our um, team in Oxford who's been leading um, this effort. 
But I think it's important to pay tribute to the 20,000 volunteers that there are in the trials around the world, um, and over 10,000 um, here in the UK, who've come forward in this uncertain time, uh, feeling an absolute duty to play a part uh, to help us get back on our feet um, and perhaps uh, beat the virus. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in joining a clinical trial. And I think uh, for all of us, uh, having reached this point today, uh, where we have um, evidence that the vaccine works, uh, they, we have a huge debt of gratitude to all of those people um, who have taken part. Secondly, I just wanted to uh, mention all of the researchers, and Chris um, pointed out that we have this amazing infrastructure um, in this country through the NHS and through the National Institute for Health Research, which meant that with three weeks' notice, I was able to contact 19 trial sites around the UK, and research nurses and doctors could come out of the woodwork and come and work on the trial um, to allow us to move so swiftly um, this year and I think that's a unique situation that we have um, in this country that made it possible um, to do that. Uh, our results today show um, that in our primary analysis, that's uh, the analysis we agreed with all of the regulators, that the vaccine had 70% efficacy, which is fantastic. That's high efficacy, um, like we get with flu vaccines, and has the potential uh, to have a really important impact on the pandemic, because we also, in the trials, saw no one uh, go into hospital uh, with disease or develop severe disease if they had been vaccinated. Um, we also um, had these intriguing results, which you'll have heard reported in the media today, where one arm of our study had much higher efficacy, about 90%. That needs further work to look at it, but it's very exciting that there might be a way of immunizing with the vaccine that gives even better um, protection. Clearly from today, uh, we have to provide all of the data to the regulators so that they can scrutinise that very carefully and decide whether it's appropriate to move forward uh, for licensure. And we look forward to working with them to provide everything that they need for that purpose um, in uh, the days and weeks ahead. And if they do approve it, um, we potentially, with the, the dosing regime that um, could be used, we may have more doses available uh, than we thought. Uh, we have a vaccine uh, that can be used um, at fridge temperatures. It can be stored at fridge temperatures. And for, for us in Oxford, this was really important because we want to be able to make sure that this can be distributed, not just in a country like this where we can manage any form of distribution, but around the world because the virus um, actually isn't just a problem here in the UK, it is for everywhere. And our partnership with AstraZeneca um, has been critical because they agreed with our um, vision for this of having a not-for-profit approach during the pandemic um, so that no one was profiteering from um, making a vaccine um, in the uh, pandemic period. And that does mean that part of what we can um, offer uh, will be the equitable access around the world, which is absolutely um, the vision that there should be um, from um, a university. So I think it's been a great day today um, for us, and as Chris said, for science, that here we've, um, in 11 months, been able to pull together um, the, all of the data required, uh, meet the, uh, the requirements for regulators to be able to put that in front of them. And uh, I hope uh, that we'll uh, be part of um, what could be um, the, the, the end of the um, problems that we're facing that you were just hearing about um, from uh, the Prime Minister. I think in the meantime, we certainly... Professor need to Andrew Pollard from the Oxford vaccine team. Let's go straight back to our health and correspondent, access. Victoria MacDonald. Yes, well, you heard there the, the praise that uh, both Chris Whitty and Andrew Pollard gave to the teams that they were able to scramble, really, to get this done. But also from the Prime Minister, who's talking about a vaccine, yes, but in the meantime, there are still going to have to be a lot of restrictions. We are far from being out of the woods, far from being back to normal. And he talked about increasing the tier systems of, of making them stricter. He said this Christmas is not going to be normal. But he then threw ahead to Easter and said, maybe Easter will give us some hope. Maybe we'll be able to see it. But in the meantime, we will have to follow the tier restrictions again, do hands, face, space, all of that that we've got used to. And also they're going to uh, roll out further these lamp tests, uh, which he hopes too will be able to let us see our relatives in care homes and to perhaps protect the more vulnerable. Victoria, 
McDonald's. Well, I'm joined now by Dr. Katrina Pollock. She's a senior clinical research fellow in vaccinology at Imperial College London. Dr. Pollock, could you just explain? We've seen three numbers today about effectiveness, 62%, 70% and 90%. Which one should we think of as the real number to focus on? Yes, thanks very much for having me on and uh, to talk a little bit about the efficacy of the vaccine. So the 70% figure that you heard is the uh, the total analysis. So based on, on all the data that's accumulated so far in the Oxford AstraZeneca trial. And then those two other figures are based on two different arms of the trial. So uh, uh, the 60% figure is is looking at, at two, two doses, two high doses, and then the 90% figure was when a, a low dose and then a high dose of the vaccine were given. And as we heard Andy Pollard saying earlier, there is more work to be done to fully understand this, um, but it's certainly very intriguing. Right, so we shouldn't just assume that this is going to be actually be 90% effective at this stage. I think it's, it's too early to know for sure, but one of the things that I think is very exciting about the data today and, and really encouraging the thing that people need to hear is that um, in those uh, participants who had the vaccine and not the placebo, the, one, the ones who had the vaccine, there were no severe cases of COVID-19. And that's really what we need to see from the vaccine, particularly in this early, early phase of, of, of the research. And, and it's very encouraging and, and taken together with the uh, data we've um, started to see from the other vaccine trials. I think this means that we have a disease that can be modified with a vaccine. Now, the, the three vaccines that have been had their early results released over the last few days are all very different prices. Uh, this is the cheapest. Do you get what you pay for when it comes to vaccines? Uh, I don't think it really works like that. Um, uh, the, the the commercial side of it is uh, obviously going to be in terms of governing um, to some extent how the vaccines are rolled out. Um, but um, manufacturing scalability has been part of this conversation right from the beginning. And it's very encouraging to see that we um, will be able to uh, deliver a vaccine at scale. And I would certainly echo uh, what we were saying earlier uh, about uh, having a vaccine that's not for profit, that can be delivered globally, um, because that's really what we need to see in order to have a vision of firstly uh, ending the disease and then potentially in the future, perhaps even ending the infection altogether. People are obviously getting very excited about the prospect of some normality and getting back to everything being open again at some point next year. I mean, let, let me just read you one tweet by Daniel Hannan. He's a senior conservative, listened to by a lot of people in the government. He says, surely once the vaccine has been made available to vulnerable people and healthcare and care home workers, things can reopen. There's no need to cover the general population. The argument used to be that we couldn't selectively protect at-risk groups. Well, now we can. Is, th is that kind of thinking right? I, th I think we need to understand a, a bit more about how rolling out a vaccine is going to alter transmission. The, the data that we're seeing so far is showing us that we have a disease that is modifiable with a vaccine. Uh, and, and that is coming out of all of these trials. And, and that is certainly is you know, the first hurdle. And um, we, let's not underestimate how powerful vaccines are. They are one of the most powerful tools that we have in our armory of public health measures. Um, but in terms of preventing uh, transmission, that is a very, very important goal. We don't know yet how these vaccines will do that. We need to have a proper public health strategy that looks not just at the short term, but the medium and the long term in order to do that so that we can uh, uh, protect the most vulnerable people in our society. Dr Pollock, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, the latest official figures for the UK, which often tend to be lower on a Monday, show that in the last 24 hours, there have been 15,450 new infections. A further 206 deaths have been reported, and that takes the government total to 55,230.